Welcome back to the New Jersey State Museum's Ask the Experts Video Learning Library, where we're digging into some of the most common questions people ask paleontologists about what we do and how we do it. In the last episode, we talked about how paleontologists decide where on Earth's surface to look for dinosaurs. That is, how we find rocks that are the right age and the right type. We're on the hunt for dinosaurs, so we're looking for sedimentary rocks that are between 65 and 230 million years old. But once you know generally where to look, how do you know exactly where to start digging? How do we know in the middle of all of this vast terrain exactly where to dig? Why don't we start digging into those questions right now? The short answer is we don't know where the fossils are. First, we have to find them. And the process of finding fossils is called prospecting. Now, prospecting is just a fancy word for walking around slowly, looking at the ground. And what you're looking for are little scraps of bone or teeth that are weathering out of the ground. Now, it could take us days or even weeks to find even a single scrap of bone. Or you could be really lucky and be in a place like this, where there are fossils all around us. Why don't we take a look? As you may have seen while we were prospecting, almost every fossil you find is just a single isolated piece of bone or tooth. Very rarely will you find a big bone or more of the skeleton. And that could be because part of the skeleton has already washed away, or maybe it wasn't even fossilized in the first place. Or there could be a good bit more fossil just slightly hidden from view in the ground. Here though we have a nice accumulation of bone and we're going to collect this. But where do we look from here? Well, up is always a good place to start. Weathering and erosion are the major forces in places like this, sculpting and carving the land into spectacular and rugged formations you see around me. Those same forces are also at work on the fossils within the rocks. Weathering breaks the fossils into smaller pieces, and erosion and gravity pull those broken bits downhill. So if you're very lucky, you can follow those broken bits like a trail of breadcrumbs to a skeleton still lying hidden somewhere in the hillside. So it looks like some of those bones we collected down there may have come from these bones that are still in the ground. What you got, Alana? Hey, Jason. Um, we have uh, a bone right here. We think it might be a rib. Um, we also have some plant material that's right here. And these pinkish white bits are some bivalves. We think they might be clams. So because of that, it's possible that this might have been a lake environment. Um, we also found these triceratops teeth, which appear to be in pretty good condition. Yeah, they look great. So this may not look like much, but this is how some of paleontology's greatest discoveries come about. We started with just a few scraps of bone down at the bottom of the hill, and they led us here to a few more bones still in the rock, but there's no way of knowing how much more of the skeleton may still be inside this mountain. As you may have seen while we were prospecting, it didn't take very long at all just to find things. And many of these things are just broken pieces of fossil, or even pieces of modern plants, or the skeletons of little animals that live out here. Many other times they're just rocks that look like fossils. And many people often ask us, how do you tell the difference between the rock and the fossil? To many people, the fossil looks just like the rock. Well, there actually are a lot of different tricks we use to help us tell the difference between the rock from the fossil that work almost every single time. But we better start digging into those questions next time. Until then, as always, thank you for joining us and keep digging.